Uh, thank you for asking me to come and speak to you today, and I will try and follow on from the, the two very moving talks that we've heard. Um, I'm a community psychiatrist. I work for Manchester Mental Health and Social Care Trust with a community mental health team in Withenshaw in South Manchester. I'm not going to say anything very clever today. Um, I'm just going to tell you what I do, how our service works. Services in Manchester are arranged as a series of functional teams. So a patient with schizophrenia who presents for the first time might first of all be seen by the early intervention service. Um, if the patient's acutely unwell, they might see the crisis team who might look after them for up to six weeks. And if necessary, if the situation can't be managed at home, they might come into the inpatient unit. So our service, the community mental health team, um, sees people with schizophrenia who are not in the very acute stages of illness. And obviously some people um, with schizophrenia are managed um, just in primary care by their GPs as well. Um, what I thought was it might help to imagine a very typical um, clinical situation that we do come across. So, for example, a patient's mum calls to say that she's worried about her son. He stopped taking medication a few weeks ago. He's begun to experience hallucinations. And as a result, he's started to drink more as a means of trying to block out the voices he's hearing. He also has epilepsy and his tenants is at risk because he's accrued some rent arrears. I believe that the essence of what we do has to do with relationships. And the first of these is our relationship with the patient. And I, I do hear what Ros was saying about the, the frequent changes of consultant. When I came into post, um, there'd been a series of locums in the job before me. Um, I've been there about four years now, and, um, and patients keep saying, are you staying? Are you, you know, are you going to leave? Um, and and, and that's it, it, it's important because when we, um, we get to know patients over a number of years, we get to know their families, sometimes we even um, treat more than one member of the same family, and we get to know patients when they're well. Um, so our fictional patient might say to me, well, yes, I stopped my medication because actually I've put it on a stone and weight, I feel like a zombie, I'm really drowsy, um, and I, I, I feel embarrassed about, uh, about the weight I've gained. And what we try to do is enter into a dialogue, really, about medication. And, um, and I think the days are gone now when we would say to patients, we, this is the medication, you're taking it. Um, what we try to do is, is say, well, there's no magic cure, there's no one size fits all. Um, how can we try and talk with you and work together to a solution that's going to maximise your quality of life, minimise the side effects that you're getting? Um, and that's only achievable if we've got a trusting relationship with the patient and, and if we know them, we know a bit about them and we know whether they're a city supporter or um, a, a talented pianist or so and it's important these things. So I, I think because we, you know, we're asking them to take medication which is um, powerful, it has, it's toxic, it has unpleasant side effects. Um, I think we're just beginning to get to grips with the effects that our drugs have had on um, patients and particularly with regard to um, the diabetes and the metabolic syndrome and the weight gain patients have experienced. It's something we're working very hard to try to improve our monitoring of the physical parameters of these patients and, um, and also to try and promote a healthy lifestyle as well in terms of dietitian and, and, and fitness interventions. Of course, it's unrealistic to expect that um, someone's symptoms are going to improve if they're struggling with poor housing or financial hardship or family breakdown. And this is really where the community team comes in, in terms of um, different expertise in different individuals, so nurses, social workers, occupational therapists, support workers, psychologists. Um, Ideally, I think what we do is uh, patients would have a, a care coordinator, they would be responsible for arranging a care plan, making sure that that's implemented. Um, and I think the reality is that not all patients do have a care coordinator. It, you know, it would be nice if, if we could offer that, and I'm aware that there's unmet need and that patients do wait sometimes without a care coordinator. Um, and then I think, as Ros has said, there are frequent changes of care coordinator in some teams. Um, in our example, um, 
this young man may also benefit from um, welfare and benefits advice and that's something that we try to offer as well um, and we also link in with employment and training and I think those issues around um, readiness to return to work and a, a huge anxiety about getting a letter from DWP saying you've got to come for an interview um, is very distressing for patients. There may be times when some of our patients lose capacity to take decisions regarding their care and treatment and um, it's something we need to work harder at to make sure that patients are involved in um, being um, developing a care plan and actually being being part of that not just being presented with a fait accompli um, and when we survey patients many say that they don't describe much um, sense of involvement currently the second key relationship is with the carers Carers know our patients much better than we do, and um, and I think it's um, it's essential that we do have a relationship with them. We recognise there can be a high degree of stress related to being a carer. Um, we we do offer a carers assessment annually, and um, and I think I think it's right. It shouldn't be tokenistic. I think it needs to be. Um, actually taking account of the carers views and needs I think we always tread a difficult line with um, the balance between maintaining confidentiality for patients and then also giving information to carers I don't always know the answer to that and I think you know I may be guided by um, carers here today who, who would have a view how do we how do we balance that issue really um, in our scenario, the, um, I think the, the care coordinator would play a crucial role in supporting the mum who's phoned up about her son who was ill. The final area where good relationships are crucial is in our interface with other professions and teams. And depending on the severity of, of our fictional patient's um, relapse, he may require the services of another team, the crisis team or the inpatient team. We commonly hear patients say, when I'm not well, I want someone who knows me, who knows what I like, uh, I'm like when I'm ill, who knows what I like when I'm well. I don't want to tell my story half a dozen times to people that don't know me. And I think in some respects, these functional teams can work well. Um, and the idea would be that someone retains a care coordinator who's the link as they move through these teams. I think in reality, the, there are real problems with communication and the danger if a patient moves between a series of teams is actually instead of being assessed on the basis of their needs, they're assessed on the basis of their eligibility for a team and, and teams will say, oh, that, that's not for us, that's not for us. And there's a danger that, um, that patients can get lost. And when we have serious untoward incidents occur, inevitably poor communication is raised as an issue. We're, um, we're hampered by a lack of up-to-date IT systems to ensure that we communicate effectively. And we need to make sure that patients aren't slipping through the net. G GPs tell us that it can be bewildering to be faced with an array of teams when they're trying to refer an acutely unwell patient. It's something that our trust is, is looking at about how patients come into the service and their pathway through it to try to make that um, more understandable and usable. And it can be extremely distressing for patients and carers if inpatient admission is required and then there's no inpatient bed available. Um, our trust has been working very hard to reduce the numbers of patients waiting for a bed. And likewise, the patients waiting on an acute ward who don't really need to be there, but there's no suitable accommodation for them to move on to. Patients are understandably anxious when they're admitted to an acute ward. And I think there are some excellent examples of good practice um, on wards in which staff are engaged well with patients. There's adequate occupational uh, resources. Patients feel they're safe and supported. And the common factor on these wards tends to be the influence of um, high quality senior nursing staff. And they model good practice. And th those values then seem to filter down into, um, into the staff at all levels. Beyond our own trust, there are other important relationships. I'm very fortunate to work with some marvellous GPs, and we tend to communicate several times a week. They're very skilled, um, experienced clinicians. They manage an awful lot of, um, of mental health care within primary care, but they do value personal contact and rapid access to a specialist opinion. But again, I think we could improve our communication with them, particularly around prescribing. And going back to our patients, our fictional patients, I would also um, try to explore the other reasons why he might be feeling drowsy, drugged up, like a zombie. I've worked very hard to develop um, 
links with other medical specialties, particularly cardiology and neurology. And if this young man has epilepsy, I would be on the phone to the neurologist asking for a review. Perhaps it's his epilepsy medication which is causing the problem. It's these personal relationships which allow us to help our patients negotiate the complexities of the healthcare system, as some may be under a series of different consultants. And it also allows us to challenge some of the stigma, which sadly is, also, is still faced by patients when they encounter um, other medical specialties. Our patient in the scenario had been drinking heavily, and unfortunately substance misuse is not uncommon in patients with schizophrenia, often as a means of trying to um, deal with their symptoms. So we work closely with other agencies, the Manchester Drug Service, the Community Alcohol Team, housing agencies, and for a minority of patients, probation or police services. Many of our patients are also parents, and there may also be an involvement with children and families um, social services. We're closely allied to Manchester University, and this is a centre of excellence for research into schizophrenia. A large number of our patients take part in research trials. We also train medical students and students from other professions, and this really gives us an opportunity to challenge preconceptions about schizophrenia and encourage interested students to explore the idea of a career in mental health, because we need to attract good people into these professions. We only have our medical students for um, a placement of 16 days in mental health out of their five years, so we have to make an impact early on. So for our fictional scenario, it's necessary for us to consider the relationships with the patient themselves, the carers, and our broader relationships and how we fit into the system. As clinicians, the challenge is to deliver consistently high quality care to all our patients whilst engaging with them as individuals. Thank you.